Well, well thank you very much. And uh, when, your, when your bio gets to be that long, you, the one thing you know is that you're, you're old, okay? Uh, unfortunately, but that's the reality. Um, so today I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna illustrate to you the possibilities of what can happen. And, and I, I would say this has been going on all day, these, this very thing I'm about to mention. The possibilities of what can happen when technology and data and competitive sports all collide and merge. Um, and I think what you'll find are some interesting, this, this is an interesting application of how far a sports team, in this case a Major League Baseball team, will go to try to gain a competitive uh, edge on the field of play. Um, first, I'm gonna start by, uh, by talking about the, um, the exponential growth in data and information that we've seen with the digital transformation we're going through in all phases of our life, but it's really impacted what's going on in, in not only today's world, but in Major League Baseball. And, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, the way in which um, uh, we capitalize on this new data to basically gain a competitive advantage on the field. And I'm gonna focus on um, the batter-pitcher matchup as, as the construct, which of course is one of the most important elements of the whole game of, um, of, of baseball. Um, so in terms of the, the data explosion, just to put this in perspective, and this isn't of course baseball specific, but each and every day, there's about 400 million tweets. Actually, I probably need to, to update that. This is one of those data, pieces of data that if you don't, if you don't uh, uh, check it every probably 60 to 90 days, you're gonna be lagging behind. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's a very conservative estimate from a couple of months ago when I, when I looked, at, looked that up. Um, a billion uh, Facebook status updates, a half a billion images uploaded uh, to Facebook, and 100 million hours of Netflix video streamed. This is each and every day across the world. So th that, that is the world in which we in which we reside today. Um, and of course, this has impacted um, sports as well. And this is a graph analysis of every shot in a Roger Federer, Andy Murray uh, tennis match. Uh, and it basically uh, charts every single shot made in that match. And we now have data on things like the velocity, the launch angle, the spin rate of, of every shot in a tennis match. And this um, uh, slide is actually the analysis that distills it down to just the winning shots. So here's a sport, tennis, which I don't know, maybe we do think of it as a data intensive sport, but I think a lot of us don't think of it that way, at least not compared to the, some of the other sports where there are volumes of publicly available data. So it, to me, this is just a good illustration of how far reaching uh, data analytics has come finding its way into tennis. And this, by the way, isn't even a particularly current slide. This is from five or six years, well, it's from the London Olympics, as you can see. So this has been around a while. Um, the, the data and information revolution has really been fueled by technology, including wearable tech, where we can now capture real-time uh, data uh, from, from athletes' performance uh, on the field, and, and we can capture data from uh, RFID or GPS and, and a host of other technologies. Um, here's a situation where we're now able to monitor track player tracking and monitor the movement of players, but we also capture from those athletes in game or in practice situations, fatigue information, health information, beyond just performance data. And then there's of course um, sports like baseball which use um, high speed, uh, uh, and if those of you who were here for, for Andy's presentation immediately preceding this, you learned much about this, but there's Doppler radar, there's high speed cameras that are all in combination to get what we get now from a uh, from, from a baseball game. And you know, starting with, for example, um, the hit FX uh, data on what happens to batted balls, or now it's the StatCast data, I should say, on what can happen from a batted ball. There's an actually uh, quite a, a rare instance of Jay Bruce actually doing damage to a baseball. So um, try to remember this now, because it's, you're not gonna see it for a, a while probably, or maybe ever again, but, um, 
Uh, he just uh, had a terrible run in New York, so I had to say that, uh, being from New York. Um, the, um, this also, we have, we have pitching, uh, the same thing for pitching, and again, for those of you who were here earlier, we went deeper on this with Andy, but basically, um, we're now looking at how far in front of the pitching rubber the ball is released because that changes the perceived velocity or really the, more, the important measure of velocity, which is the reaction time a hitter has to react. If you release the ball that much closer to the plate at the same exact raw speed, you have less time to react. Um, so, so that's one little nuance of it. But beyond that, we're getting all sorts of detail on spin rate and spin axis on the pitches. Which, is, which makes a big difference in terms of what, what the movement of the pitch is. Um, and, and in defensive metrics, um, you know, we get maximum speed, we get total distance, and for, for those of you who were here before, I totally agree with what Andy said, that route efficiency is really a, a useless measure. Uh, I, I am not convinced that a straight line to where the ball ends up is, is actually the optimal route to the ball because if there's wind in play and so forth, you, you might want to come at the ball a different way. So I, I don't think we really know enough about route efficiency to assume that a straight line to the ball uh, is, is optimal, number one. And number two, um, we don't have any baseline really. Uh, f there's never been a baseline published to say that uh, 98 is the league average and what's, what's a good number and what's a bad number. So it's not one we pay much attention to, but there are some other like, like first step reaction time is, is an important one, not on this slide, but, uh, but it is an important one. Um, and of course, even, even base running metrics, um, these, are, these are not occurring in real time. This is superimposed, as you can see, these two runners, Pedroia and Bogarts, uh, uh, and they have running stats on, on essentially both of them, uh, continuing the Boston theme that Andy brought. But, um, but you know, th this is all very new. If, if we take, let's take a look back at where at the history of, of baseball data and, and where it all started. So if we go back uh, to the first 110 years of the sport, that's the beauty of baseball. We can go back to the you know mid, well, the late, the late 19th century, you know, 1870, let's say, the first professional games. But if we look at from say 1870 to 1980, for the most part, this, you know, this box score doesn't look, this is from 1920 it does not look that different than the box score from 1965 or 1970. There's a little, a little evolution of it. But essentially, this is what we knew about the events that went on in a baseball game. Okay? Then, come 19, about 1980, we began to get the, what we call play-by-play -play data, where we actually, instead of knowing the batter went two for five, we can tell you that those two were a single to right field, a double to left center, and that he struck out twice and popped up to short and the other three at bats. So that's what we started to get. And we even know what the count was on an 0-2 count, on a 2-1 count, et cetera, uh, of what happened uh, you know, during, during those games so, or during that plate appearance. So that was really an advance. Uh, but again, we're talking about relatively little data, and I'll put that in perspective in a minute than we have today. And then we got to, in about 2008, we got to this pitch FX era where we started to get, with some of the data capture technologies going on at the ballpark, where we started to get much more um, detail. So we, we then had 20 measures for each of about 700,000 pitches per year in Major League Baseball, and about five measures through the hit FX platform uh, for the 150,000 or so batted balls each year. So this is where we began to get the exit velocity of the ball coming off the bat, the vertical launch angle, the horizontal launch angle, and so forth. But now we've got to the point where we've got the stat cast data. So how much more data do we have today with stat cast? Well, to put this in perspective, we actually have 1.3 million times more data of what goes on during a baseball game today not than 1870, not than 1980, than just 10 years ago, than just pre-pitch FX, okay? What, think about that, and this is measured in terms of storage. 1.3 million times more data, that's what happens when you get continuous tracking data, which takes up an enormous amount of storage space. So um, this is, we've, we've truly entered the big data era 
of, of baseball with this kind of player tracking data. Basketball is doing it with Sport View, um, and, uh, and other sports will quickly follow in terms of you know, continuous player tracking. Uh, we're able to now measure, measure base running stats. We, we measure the optimal turn around first base that a player makes when he's rounding the bag to go to second. We look at distance uh, speed, rather, from first to third, from first to home, from second to home. And we're going to be able to talk about how much impact a right fielder has on holding runners to, and cutting down uh, extra bases, whereas we just did that based on, say, the perceived strength of the, of the throwing arm and not really adjusting for the runner that was running. Uh, so things like outfield assists will become a footnote to what a true measure is of an outfielder's defensive ability. Um, to, to say this another way, the, to put this in perspective about the volume of data. So, uh-oh. Okay, there we go. Wrong button. To put this in perspective, um, on opening day in 2015, the first day we truly had stat cast for all of Major League Baseball, on opening day, the Cubs played the Cardinals at Wrigley Field in April 2015. So remember, everything up to this was pre-StatCast, but it included the pitch FX data. Um, at the conclusion of this game, we put in the books, or really on the disc, I guess you'd say, uh, a, an extra terabyte of, uh, of baseball data that was captured during a game. That one terabyte came from that Cubs-Cardinals game. At that point, we had 190,000 baseball games, professional baseball games played that totaled a cumulative 1.5 gig. So this one game on that one day in April represented 99.6% of the data for the history of baseball. I mean, again, I just want to point out how staggering the, the you, you know, if we couldn't do a chart because we'd have to go above the, the fourth floor to, to get to the top of the chart, we started here. So, um, again, you know, obviously that's been diluted now because we've had 2,400-plus uh, 2, games last year, 2,400-plus games in 2015 and so forth. So, so now we've had over 5,000 games or just about 5,000 games at this, at this new rate. Uh, but it's, it's incredible to see what, uh, you know, where this has gone. So with that as a backdrop uh, on some of the history of the data, I want to shift gears and talk about how we tried to build this competitive advantage and, and, and with, with the team that I'm consulting with and, and what uh, problem we tried to solve. So, you know, I, I chose a question that I, that I think, uh, I, I advised them to choose a question that was really at the core of the sport and of the competitiveness of the sport, and that is, uh, what do we expect the outcome to be for a batter-pitcher confrontation? And if we could develop some unique insights into how a batter and pitcher might, perf might be expected to perform against one another uh, to alter the way we programmed that during the course of a game, either with the pitching change or, or stack the hitters, uh, that we might have a true uh, advantage. And by the way, I'll mention that this was almost identical to the case problem that was given uh, in the uh, Analyze This uh, case uh, that just went on upstairs, the Mini Analytics Challenge. And uh, there were um, a number of, of student teams and actually teams from all over that uh, engaged in trying to, they, it was a little different in that they tried to uh, pick Daily Fantasy FanDuel, the Daily Fantasy site's points, whereas I was looking to actually help them predict um, success on the field of play, which is, which is slightly different than the way the the points are counted uh, for, for FanDuel. Um, so, um, you know, the, the way that this could impact the game, the, fairly obvious, right? It could impact the way you, 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 who you played in that game, the starting lineups. It might affect the batting order and how you hit them. It might affect your pinch hitters and, of course, could also affect your, your relief pitchers. So, you know, to frame the prevailing approach, to frame the problem, let's look at the prevailing approach of how teams would historically have gone about this and do go about this to a degree today. Um, they basically look at the very literal head-to-head -head matchup data when a pitcher faced a hitter. And the problem with that is fairly obvious, right? Number one is you've got really small sample sizes. In fact, you have many instances where you have zero sample size. 
uh, given all the new, uh, the new pitchers and the new hitters that come into the league on a continuous basis, uh, that's, that's clearly a problem. But even when it's not a problem, the sample sizes are never, never really sufficient. And if you do get a sufficient sample size of 60 or 70 plate appearances, which is fairly rare, one batter against one pitcher, it probably spans seven or eight or nine or more years. At that point, you have to question whether the, it's meaningful to count data from 2008 when we're sitting here in 2017 and looking at how we should expect to perform against one another when the athletic skills of these two players will have deteriorated perhaps or certainly uh, progressed at, at different rates, most likely. Um, and then a separate problem entirely, and this is one that the, uh, that, the, that the groups who were in the data challenge had to deal with, is you were dealing with outcome data only, okay, which is a huge limiting factor if you don't have the process metrics. So when I mean the, when I talk about outcome data, I'm talking about the ultimate end result of the batter-pitcher matchup, double, pop-up, et cetera. The process measures are the exit velocity, the launch angles, and so forth. Those stabilize at a much smaller sample size and are much more predictive than outcomes. So in the, in the, in the, um, the data challenge that we just discussed upstairs a couple hours ago, uh, that was one of the clear handicaps of, of trying to get accuracy. Um, so the, the, the approach I took was really modeled after the way Netflix predicts a viewer's preferences for movies, right? So instead of stopping at how a viewer rated a movie, they take, and taking this rating at face value, which would be the equivalent of considering the head-to-head -head matchups of a batter and a pitcher, um, they actually dig much deeper and deconstruct the movie into its attributes. So when I'm talking about attributes, I'm talking about the highly detailed component parts of a given movie. It might be something like uh, set in 19th century England, or it might be um, strong female lead, or it might be visually striking, um, or it might be high suspense. But whatever those attributes are, those are the specific components of the movie itself. Um, and Netflix wants to know how you're related to the various attributes of the movie more than they're interested in whether you like the movie or not. So, and, and by looking at your overall ratings of multiple movies, again, these attribute ratings, they can tease out how you respond to different attributes. So they delve into the mind of the viewer, arguably even beyond the cognitive, uh, the cognitive level of the viewer, him or herself. Um, and, and they analyze the attitudes and preferences for the attributes to draw correlations to other movies. And then by, by using statistical analysis, they can determine why you like the movie. Um, and, and therefore, what attributes are most meaningful to you. So this approach allows the likes and the dislikes of the viewer to, be, to come to light and basically allows you, has a highly predictive value and it, and it can, because it can place a value that you put on each attribute of a movie. So the analogy continues. I basically took the same approach. I treated the pitcher as the movie and the batter as the viewer. And I started out by trying to understand what pitcher attributes influence batter performance or batter pitcher outcomes. And in, and in doing so, I basically started by talking to people in the game, hitting coaches, coaches, managers, and a couple of players and said, you know, what, what is it that, what do you want to know as a hitter when, you, when you're walking up to the play? What do you want to have in your, in your mind or what do you want to have in your preparation session about what, uh, so that you can perform at your highest level. And really there were five general themes or, or areas. One is, I wanna know what he throws. I wanna understand his pitch repertoire. The, the second thing is, I wanna understand his basic velocity. Is he sort of centered around a fastball at 92, a fastball at 96, a uh, fastball at 88? Um, what kind of movement does his pitches get? Does he tend to, uh, do the balls, will the balls typically tail into me? Uh, will, he, will he work the outside corner of the plate? Um, uh, you know, and, 
and will he make me sort of reach for the ball? Also, where do his pitches come from? Where's his release point? Um, many hitters have a favorite release spot where they can see the ball better, feel more comfortable for the ball. Maybe it's the fear of getting hit when a guy's coming from the side or whatever, but it's, it's, uh, there are built-in biases to where the pitch originates from, so that release point is a critical variable. And then oh, the last one is a little bit more, um, uh, I would say, um, stylistic, and it's, you know, wh what is his pitching style? What are the two and three pitch sequences he likes to, he likes to, he favors and so forth. And you can see the variables that entered into the model based on these five categories or five factors. So we put things like, you know, the top two pitches, the, the pitch repertoire, the horizontal location, the, you know, vertical location. D does he work up in the strike zone? Does he tend to pound the bottom of the strike zone? Does he try to get chases away? Uh, what kind of movement does he have? Um, where was his release point? Is he, is he a guy who gets swinging strikes or is he a guy that really pitches to contact? Uh, zone percent means the percent of times he throws the ball in the strike zone. Edge percent would be the, the percent of time that he works the corners. Does he have good command? And then the top sequencing. So we rolled all of these, and there's, I don't have 14 up there, so there's a couple of others, but they're in that same vein. They're just sub, -cat, you know, sub data points from that group into it. And um, we, we come up with, um, I want to sort of display this visually. So, so this is a graph analysis, a graph chart of right-handed pitchers against left-handed batters. And one of the things you'll see here is that the colors are clusters of pitchers with a fairly high degree, I forget the exact threshold, but degree of similarity to one another. Um, so, you know, there's this cluster down here, which is fairly distinctive. There's, there's the green cluster up there. You may be wondering why some of the colors look further away from themselves, like the yellow, than they are from other data points. Well, that's because we flatten this to two dimensions. So if, if all of those yellow dots are five feet behind the screen, then in fact they are much closer to each other than they are to the green or the purple. Um, this was done in probably, this data is probably 2010, 2011. I'm gonna ask if anyone knows who the two outliers might be. They're right-handed pitchers. Tim Wakefield and R.A. Dickey, the two knuckleball pitchers who were pitching as starting pitchers. This is only starting pitchers. I don't have relievers in here. So two knuckleball pitchers, very astute. Uh, but they are very similar to one another and totally unique with respect to some of the, many of the factors that were in our list. Um, so if we, if we hone in a little bit more on this uh, lower, lower left, um, here's some names. And again, this is, as I say, about five years old. Now, I want to say it's, maybe it's 2011, 2012 data. It was two years of data. Um, these are pictures that had, that were, would be characterized, and it's very tough to characterize a cluster when, you've, when you're building it from 14 attributes. But, so we did our best to, to label it, but the labels don't do it justice. But these are guys who are relatively high velocity fastball guys. They're guys who tend to have low pitch variety, so they're probably really a two pitch pitcher, uh, maybe an occasional third pitch. And they tend to work, relatively speaking, uh, you know, because a lot of pitchers work very down in the zone these days, these pitchers tended to throw the ball a little bit higher in the zone. It probably means that they had a lot of their pitches from about here, you know, to just above the waist is probably what high in the zone means. So that was the best characterization we can come up with. Um, so, um, you know, what, one of the, the, so that's a little bit of a snapshot of the clustering analysis that came out of this, this Netflix approach. The second point I want to move on to, because it's also a very important um, add-on, if you will, or tweak to this, um, to this approach, is to not just rely on outcome measures. Um, so the, the, rely, the reliance on batted ball versus the final result was a key part of the modeling work that we did. Uh, they're far more predictive. The outcomes themselves, the final results, have too much random variation. And using batted ball data allows you to pick the, predict the context in any ballpark, okay? 
So on the ballpark front, let me show you what we did. We, we basically divided, uh, this is Turner Field in, uh, um, in Atlanta, which is now closed for the new ballpark we'll be opening in April. And we divided the field into um, a thousand, actually a thousand different cells. Now they weren't literally physical cells the way I'm representing them here. They were cells based on vertical launch angle, horizontal launch angle, and exit velocity. So think of it that way. I'm visually depicting it as if they were landing spots on the field. It's not exactly that. Um, and so we then would look at, say, a, a, the, the trajectory and the combinations of those three factors that I just said that would, would, would translate into the ball getting to about that spot. And you know, let's say it would be 61% of the time a single, 25% of the time a double, and 14% of the time an out. So then what we're able to do is we're able to assign a total base value or a run value, if you will, or linear weights. You can do anything you want. I'm just simplifying it here to total bases um, for that cell. Now, the, the reason that that's an important, let's overlay Yankee Stadium on that, okay? So now if you look at Yankee Stadium and you see the difference in the outfield, the brown line, the gray line is Turner Field, the red line is Yankee Stadium. So you can see that gap right there um, are essentially the gap between the two ballparks. Yes? <laughs> I'm, I'm say, that, say that again, I'm not sure what you're saying. Right, that, yeah. Well, this is just saying if he does hit, for every, forget about him, forget about the word him, for every ball hit at an exit velocity, a launch angle, it's, it's predicting where the ball will land. And now what I'm going to tell you is the different, where I'm going with this is the dramatic difference in the outcome based on which park it is, right? So, so here, you know, we're basically saying if the ball's hit into that zone, it's a out, you know, 70% of the time. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's a home run, probably 100% of the time at Yankee Stadium, and it's an out a percentage of the time, a home run a percentage of the time, and so forth. In fact, if you look at this chart, it'll, it'll sort of summarize it, this heat map. So basically, um, we've got vertical launch angle on the vertical axis. We've got